are so thankful to the Lord for this blessed opportunity as we celebrate 137 year, years of existence. We want to enter the worship experience. We're going to have our praise team come and, and give us an opening song, and we'll continue in the experience of worship. Come on, clap your hands. Oh. Come on, we come to bless the Lord. We come to magnify his name. Come on, Hallelujah. clap your hands. Hallelujah. How many know that the Lord is good? Hallelujah. Come on, say, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy enduring forever. Oh, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy enduring forever. Hey, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy enduring forever. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy enduring forever. People from every nation. From every nation and hey, from generation, come on, say we worship. we worship. Come on, say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship, we worship. Come on, for who you are, hey, we worship, we worship. Say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. For who you are, for who you are, oh, you are good. You are come on, good. clap your hands. You are, yes, you are, yes, you are. Come on, say, you are good all the time. All the time, come on, say, you are good. You are good. You are all the time, all the time, all the time, you are good. All the time, all the time, all the time, say you are good. You are good. All the time, all the time, you are good. You are good. Come on, clap your hands. You are good. You are good. You are good. All the time. All the time. You are good. You are good. All the time. All the time. You are good. You are good. You are good. You are good. People from every nation. Hey. From generation to generation, we worship. We worship you. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey. We worship. We worship for who you are. Who you are. Hey. Say we worship. We worship you. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey. Hallelujah. We worship. We worship for who you are. Come on, say for who you are. For who you are. For who you are. For who you are. You are good. Come on, clap your hands. Come on. Hey. Say, I can't feel the presence of the Lord, and I'm going to get my blessing right now. I can't feel the presence of the Lord, and I'm going to get my blessing. See, I can feel the presence of the Lord, and I'm going to. I can feel 
the prayer to serve. Hey. Oh, come on. I can feel. Prayer to serve. And I'm going to. Yes, sir. I can feel. Prayer to serve. I'm going to. Prayers up, up. 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 Come on, listen. Can't you see him working on the outside? I can feel him moving on the inside. So come on, enter in. Cast your cares on him. He opened up a window and bore you up a blessing. Cause when the Lord steps in, he got everything you need. Healing power and victory. It's all up to you. Whatever you needed to do, just trust the man believing. Have faith that we'll receive it. I can't. I can't Can't you see him moving on the outside? I can feel him moving on the inside. Come to the winter in, and cast your candle here. He opened up a window and pour you up the sink. When the Lord steps in, he's got everything you need. Healing power and victory. It's all up to you. Whatever you need to do, just trust the man, believe him. I think you will receive. I can't feel hey. Amen. Happy anniversary, Macedonia. Amen. 137 years. Sound like we come to celebrate. Amen. If you were uh, stand with us this morning, we're going to just go right into our responsive reading for the morning. It will follow by, amen. Uh, there you are. I want to make sure you was over there. Amen. Follow by our congregation to him. Lift up your voice and sing. Amen. Amen. Our responsive reading, which is noted in our bulletin, it will be coming out of Acts 1 and 8, Mark 16, 15 through 16, John 17, 18, 18 through 21, Acts 13, 1 through 5. But ye shall have power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through the truth. Now there were in the church that was in, at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon there was Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian which has been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus, all, and when they were 
they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also in John in their midst. Amen. Amen. Our congregation of him, lift every voice and sing. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, thank you so much for this great moment and opportunity it is to come to you, the living God, the creator of heaven and earth. Father, we come to worship your name today. We want to thank you, O oh God, for 137 years here at Massanoda Missionary Baptist Church. Father, we thank you for blessing us, O oh God, protecting us and providing for us in every need that we have according to your riches and glory. Father, we thank you today, O oh God. Have mercy upon us as we worship your name. All day, O oh God, we give in praise to you. Father, we pray right now asking that you forgive us of our sins. 
Father, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Anything we've done contrary to your will, have mercy upon us today, O oh Lord. Cleanse us right now through the blood of Jesus. I cover this service and all this day with the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, the Holy Spirit rebuke any unclean spirit is trying to hinder the work of God that is to be done here at Macedonia. Father, we thank you for Pastor Barnes and Mother Barnes. We pray that you anoint them afresh, O oh Lord. We cover them with the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for instilling in his heart a vision for your people. We pray, God, that we are able to follow in line with your will and your work, O oh Lord. We pray right now, God, that you will bless every heart and every mind that is set aside here today. Father, by the power of your word in Mark 16, 17, I stand against any spirit of affirmity on your people today. We speak against any devil that may try to come against your people today. We cast out any devil right now in the name of Jesus, O oh Father. We open up our heart to worship for you today. We don't want any hindrance, O oh Lord. Our heart and our minds are open to receive the word of God. We pray right now for Pastor uh, Pastor Critton, oh God, that will bring the word of God today. Crown him, oh God, with the head of wisdom, oh Lord. Bless him and his family and his congregation. We thank you, oh God, for allowing him to take the time out to come and worship with us. We thank you for the word that you will bring forth to your people today. Our hearts and minds are open to receive, and it's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ we receive it now. Amen. Come on up. <laughs> Amen. We want to welcome the first congregation of church. Amen. Come on.
Do you believe on this morning? Amen. Everlasting life. Amen. We're moving forward in our service on this morning. Amen. This morning we are fortunate to have, amen, our youth drama ministry, amen, coming to minister us on this morning. So, are they ready? They are ready. Amen. A moment in black history. Man. Good morning, Macedonia. Good morning. It has been said that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. This quote is certainly true when you consider the history of the Israelites after the death of Joshua. Listen to what the Bible says in Judges chapter 2, verse 10. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. What a sobering indictment. Now here at Macedonia, we have seen the power of the Holy Spirit. We've experienced miraculous healings. We've heard the moving and powerful testimonies in which the Lord made a way out of no way. So it would be difficult for us to believe that the younger generation we are raising up could ever stray from the Lord. However, if we are not careful, the same thing that happened then could also happen now. In fact, if we take a closer look around us, we can see the signs in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, and even in our own homes. But like all other issues we face, we can rest assured that the Lord has already provided a solution through his word. Look what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Only take care, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Listen what the Bible says in Psalm number 78. Give ear, O people, to my teaching. I will utter things that have, we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will tell the coming generations of the glorious deeds of the Lord, of his might, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, so that they can set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So as we conclude our celebration of Black History Month in obedience to God's command, we have passed the baton of our faith as well as our culture to the next generation. Let's receive our children this morning as they present the beloved classic, The Creation, from James Weldon Johnson's God's Trombone's Seven Sermons in Verse. He fed 
lighted his eyes and the lightning splashed. He clapped his hands and the thunders rolled. And the waters above the earth came down. The cooling waters came down. <laughs> then the green grass sprouted and the little red flowers blossomed. The pie trees pointed his finger to the sky and the oak spread his arm. The lakes tumbled oh. down in the hollows of the ground. And the rivers ran down to the sea. And God smiled again and the rainbow appeared and curled itself around his shoulder. <laughs> By a deep, wide river, he sat down. With his head and his hand, God thought. And thought. Till he thought. I'll make me a man. Up, Up from the bed, bed of the river, God scooped the clay. And by, by the bank of the, the river, river, he kneeled him down. down. And there, the great God Almighty. Who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky. Who flung the stars to the most far corner of the night. Who rounded the earth in the middle of his hand. This great God, like a man. Bending over her baby, kneeled down in the dirt, toiling over a lump of clay. Till he shaped it in his own image. Then into it he blew the breath of life. Amen. What a wonderful presentation. Amen. We thank God for Sister Marsha Randolph doing a wonderful job with our babies on this morning. I tell you, our children never cease to amaze us. Every time we think we've seen the best, amen, we come with something new, but they have done an awesome job. I think that's one more time praiseworthy. Amen. Amen. This time we will prepare our hearts for a welcome on occasion by Minister Larry Hopkins. One hundred and thirty seven years. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens. 137 years, my task is to do the welcome and the occasion. 137 years, our occasion, primarily this morning, is to come into Macedonia to praise and to worship God. This is the Lord's day. 137 years ago in 1882, freed slaves of Macedonia, Baptist denomination, needed a place to worship. 137 years ago, uh, slavery and, and voters' protection and uh, equal protection under the law, the 13th and 14th Amendment was was happening before we got to 1882. 137 years, godly men and women desiring uh, to do God's will met in houses in this area in Eatonville, known, come to be known as Eatonville, Florida. 137 years ago, I believe in my heart that as 
the founders of this church got together in their homes and and worship God and with with oppression going all over the land I, I I believe that Macedonia 137 years ago somebody heard the call uh which Paul uh talked about in Acts come on over to Macedonia a man's calling over there in a vision 137 years uh ago I believe that this church and its founders built this church on on the very uh uh word of God in Matthew when 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 Christ asked Peter who do men say I am some said John the Baptist but Peter said that that you are the Christ the son of the living God I believe in my heart that those men and women founded this church on that foundation, the truth of the word of God. 137 years stands, this church stands on the principles of the gospel, the great commission of Jesus Christ to make disciples and to evangelize. 137 years has exemplified, this church has exemplified the love of Christ at home and at abroad. 137 years ago, Christ uh, in, in Eatonville, Florida, saw it necessary uh, to help men and women to live lives worthy of a Christian. 137 years ago, Macedonia had to continue to be a light that sitteth on this corner the corner of Calhoun and Kennedy Boulevard, 137 years. Uh, we are a church that exemplifies the love of Christ. 137 years serving and worshiping and the occasion when we come into Macedonia, even 137 years ago, up until now, is to hear the word of God, to know what God's will is, to do God's work when we go. 137 years proclaiming the word of God. How could we hear uh, without a preacher? I think back in those days, those men and women know that they needed someone to lead them. 100. And 37 years ago, if you call the role, we had Richards, Johnson, Hurston, Hurston, uh, uh, Murphy, Mansfield, down through the years, man that stood in the pulpit and preached the gospel. Somewhere in those 137 years, some 47 years ago, this black-headed young boy came into Macedonia. The stuff has changed a little bit, but the gospel has not changed. 137 years ago, the man of God stood, Reverend Peter L. Lau stood preaching at Macedonia. Today, to serve the present age, we have none other than the Reverend Willie Seaborn standing preaching the word of God. 137 years ago, we thank God for this occasion for the past, for the present, for the future. Now, 137 years ago, now to this day, all of you visitors, I know you're here. I've taken too much time already, but somebody that's sitting next to you, they're gonna slip their arms around you and love on you and let you know, let you know that you have come to the only church on this hill, hillside of the road in Eatonville, Florida, where Love makes the that's the best I can do. God bless you. Amen. Can't nobody do it like Hop. Amen. <laughs> Thank God for my big brother. Amen. This time we come to a part of our service, amen, where we all can give our individual appreciation expressions, I like to call them, expressions of appreciation. Realizing all of our giving, we, giving, we cannot be God's giving. We want to, amen, give ear and adhere to the challenge that the pastor has already put before us. 
for every individual member that can and will. Amen. Being 137 years, if you can make that sacrificial offering. So God, we have already been challenged in that regard. And I'm sure everybody has already purposed in their heart what they're going to give on this morning. But just in case, amen, you still contemplate it, let the Spirit be your guide, amen. We have been given a challenge, but that's beyond tithe and offering. The reasonable service is the tithe and offering. But we have been given a challenge, and I would that you consider meeting that challenge, amen. As our usher will come and our deacon will prepare for our offering, amen. We pray that you will continue to consult God in your heart, your mind, even your spirit concerning our giving. Realizing giving is a part of worship, and God demonstrated the greatest gift, act, act of giving that ever could be given unto mankind when he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Knowing I can't pay my way into heaven, but my sin debt has already been paid in full. In my express gratitude, I just want to do what God requires and ask of me. So we would that you would get those gifts in your hand. Amen. As we look to the Lord, amen, for our offertory prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we're so grateful and thankful for 137 years you have blessed this Macedonian Missionary Baptist Church to be in existence, Lord God, being a beacon light in this community of the township of Eatonville, Lord God, and throughout the central Florida region. Knowing, Father God, that if it had not been for you who was on our side, we wouldn't be here on today. But even as we come on today, Lord God, bringing our gifts unto you, we trust that our giving will not be in vain, but pleasing and acceptable into your sight, Lord God. We thank you now, God, for this blessed privilege of being able to participate in your plan of prosperity for this, the Macedonia Community Church. Father God and we ask even now that you will bless the gift as well as the give on today and we just pray that you would take these gifts Lord God and use it for your glory as for the edification and in the furtherance of the gospel being preached throughout this central Florida region we thank you now in Jesus name we do pray amen we want to remind you for those that are not up on our push pay our push pay is always available amen to those of you that uh don't tend to have cash in your possession, amen. You can do the push pay online, amen. It's on the screen, the teleprompter up there, amen. You do that, it will prompt you from that point to do what needs to be done, amen. It's a secure site that has been proven, amen, and we use it often, amen. So we thank God for you, and we thank God for the gifts.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Scripture reading by Reverend Alfonso Bush, followed by some lecture from our choir. As we prepare for the scripture reading. passage Psalms 34 I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul shall make her boast in the Lord and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me out of all my fears. They looked unto him and were enlightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him and delivered them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is he, blessed is the man that trusted in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Well, I'm going to alter just a little bit the program. We're going to introduce our speaker to choir we sing and then we will hear from the preacher. Amen. Um, let me first of all express my appreciation for you being here today as we as we celebrate 137 years, I want to especially thank, thank our special guest, Pastor Garvey, of the Congregation of Church and his congregation uh, that come over to share. And we, we, we have gotten this thing so we, don't, we just act. We don't worry about when or where. We just act. So we enjoyed uh, the opportunity to be shared in the congregation with them. And so we have made this bond. So we, we just do what we feel. Amen. And uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, this significant mark in time is, is rather very special. It's special for me because of the fact that what I inherited in coming to this church was a people who loved the Lord and loved the church and uh, it made, made it a very easy transition 31 years ago it was a very easy transition it was not difficult at all and, um, and it continued to be um, a challenge because uh, culture changes and people changes and, and so we have to adapt to that change without the compromisation of the word of God. And so God's word has a way of penetrating any culture. And we are thankful for that. 
So we continue this theme and we continue this uh, onset of uh, this church at this location by bringing to you one of the speakers of the day, uh, preachers of the day, I don't want to call them speakers, uh, who have a part of this history uh, in the early beginnings. He's a man that is totally committed to the word of God and totally committed to the Lord himself. A uh, wonderful family man has proven himself to be dedicated to the word and who leads a ministry called Beth Tehidia. And that ministry is thriving with a wonderful congregation, which is an offspring of this this church uh, and his service is simply amazing because it's almost as if he never left here and and uh, and I don't have no problem with that and so it's so easy to call on him because he never refuses a request that I have had, whether he's filling in for me at noonday or preaching or doing a funeral or doing any charge. I've yet to hear him refuse it because he don't mind working for the Lord. And so... I am the Godfather of all his children. And so, uh, so there's no question about our bond. There's no question about our commitment and love for each other. You don't need the introduction of him, but I said to those who may not know him, you have several other names that you don't need to know, but because you don't mean much to you, but um, he will be a wonderful presenter today, and we pray for him. After the selection of the choir, we will hear from Pastor Ronald Critton, our speaker for the morning. <laughs> It was very appropriate, the scripture that Reverend Bush read, it's 34th number of Psalms, that talks about when you have fear, you call on the Lord to deliver you. Here's what we must realize is that once we become saved, we end up on the devil's hit list because he realizes that once you are saved, you now have the weapons and the tools to deal with him. But what he tries to do is he tries to convince you that the power of God is of no effect. That the power of God is not great enough so that your past can hold you back from having a wonderful future. He tries to convince you that the situations in your life are too great, that even the power of God can't change them. And when you listen to the devil, you end up putting yourself in a prison of your own mind, of your own making, not having access to the power of God. When those things happen, you need to learn how to do what Psalm says, to cry out to God. And when you cry out to God, God is the one that can deliver you. 
Come on, sissy. Help me tell the story. Try to do it on my own. Hurt me. Sing it again, Lord. Lord, oh, 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 Lord, oh, Lord, deliver me. Cause all I seem to do is hurt me. Hurt me. Nicole, Come you gotta on, get Nicole. passionate. <laughs> Deliver me. Come on, girl. Deliver me. Cause all I seem to do is hurt me. When I try to do it on my own. One more time, Lord.
You have the power to be released. You have the power to be free. And Satan no longer has a hold on your life. Today, walk out in victory. It is so. Amen. And thank God. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. We bless his holy name. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. This is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Amen. We thank God for this opportunity, this uh, privilege. It's always good to come back home. Amen. Ain't no place like home. I will tell you what even Jesus said. I will never leave you. Amen. I will never leave you. I'm going to be with you always. Amen. Even when we leave here, I'm going to be with you. At least I pray I'll be with you over there. Uh, nah, nah, that's what we're going to have to separate if you want to go somewhere else. Amen. Pastor Barnes, my pastor, my brother, my friend, my everything. Macedonia, my brothers and sisters in Christ. To our guest, Pastor, God bless you. Amen. Thank you and everyone that came with you today to make this presence in this church complete. Amen. Well, I'm going to get right at it. Uh, get right at it. 137 years, right, Harv? You said that about 137 times. <laughs> we don't know nothing else today. We know how old this church is. 137. Amen. 137. Amen. We thank God to be able to participate in such unique occasion to celebrate 137 years with that comes with that comes responsibility you know when god bless us when god bless you to witness and experience an anniversary uh, that comes with expectation and accountability uh, for a church to be established and still is functioning. Um, um, that's the favor of God. Amen. That's favor. And to whom much is given. Oh, yes, it is. Much is required. Amen. So I want to um, call our attention then briefly to a verse. Amen. A verse. This is the appetizer of the day. So I'm going to serve that. Colossians chapter 3 verse number 16, a familiar passage, if you will, that I would like for us to give consideration and observation to. 
Colossians 3 and 16, and you will find these words inspired by God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amen. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the marks, the marks of a mature church. Or we can apply that to the marks of a mature Christian. Because we know that the church is not the building, the church is the body. It's not an organization, it's an organism. And so we talk about the church, we're talking about its members. Amen. And although we're not 137 years old, we've been, gave, we've been left with a legacy that we must continue to allow to flourish. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for opportunity, occasion, opening that you've given us to fellowship with one another, most of all with you by your spirit and through your word we decrease that you might increase we pray that you be glorified that the saints might be edified we pray that the words even of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in our sight oh lord our strength and our redeemer we pray right now god that you would allow your presence and your spirit and your anointing and most importantly your word to have free course now in this room that you will consecrate captivate every heart mind ear to hear and receive what the spirit and what the word has to say to our hearts and then help us not to be just mere hearers only but doers of your word that we don't deceive ourselves that our faith won't stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God into your hands we now further commit this service worship and fellowship would that you honor yourself and glorify your name again in Jesus name we ask it and pray let everyone say amen amen the marks the marks of of a mature church the marks of a mature church the traits the characteristics if you will, we are talking about uh, the personality, if you will, of a maturing church. Marks, a mark is a visible impression to distinguish or to characterize or to make conspicuous. It ought to be obvious. It ought to be noticeable. It's a mark. It's that which signifies or qualifies or identifies. It indicates. It's an imprint. A mark. A church, a church ought, ought to have marks of maturity, especially where there is longevity it's a sad indictment to be an old fool how can we live so long and be so ignorant as we age we should evolve develop mature now, age don't always equal maturity. I know folks 60, 70, 80 years old still getting in trouble. Age don't mean always maturity. Years don't mean always maturity. See, it's not age, but application to truth. It's not years, years but yielding to the truth that matures an individual or a church. 
When we talk about maturity, we're talking about having spiritual or mental, if you will, competence. The capacity, the capability of having or showing rightness. Rightness or readiness or mellowness, if you will, um, of spirit, disposition, temperament, I would even dare say morality. A rightness of morality. Amen. That's what equates to true spirituality. When we know how to act. When we conduct ourselves and behave ourselves appropriately. To God's approval. Amen. So I want to share with us three things briefly that ought to be indicating that that we are maturing. Macedonia is 137 years and counting. And although we have not been here that long, we've been given the responsibility to give indication that we are a mature church. That we are mature believers. And there are, there, are, there are three things that kind of measure. There are some measures in this text that give some indication that we are maturing as a body and as a believer. I want to talk about work. I want to talk about witness. And I want to talk about worship. Those are indications that you are growing that you are maturing, that you are developing, when you are willing to rush in to work, reach out to witness, and run down to worship. Marks. I want you to check yourself and see if you got any marks. Usually you like to hide your marks. Mary, Mary, M Mary, Mary, K, want to help you to hide your marks. But these are spiritual marks that you ought to want to be conspicuous. Folk ought to see you coming. Know you are a child of God. Child of the king. Amen. Y'all not to be putting your light up on the bushel. But on a lampstand. That it might give light to all that's in your presence. This is Paul's letter to the church, to the saints at Colossae. Um, this was a church that Paul never really visited. Philemon, who was a native of Colossae, Paul told him in his letter to Philemon that, that let them know I'm going to try to come and see him. This is a church that Paul wrote this letter to mainly for three reasons. A, to show the supremacy of Christ. That Jesus is not just a man. He's God. The fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in him. So Paul in this letter wanted to show, because of the false teacher that had infiltrated itself up into the church, he wanted to show the supremacy, the superiority, the sovereignty of Jesus. Secondly, he wanted to lead these believers into spiritual maturity. It's not enough to go to church. You need to grow and not just go. Whole lot of folk going and not growing. Paul wanted them to grow and develop. So he wanted to lead them into spiritual maturity. And then thirdly, he wanted to inform them of his welfare and elicit their prayers. He wrote this letter during his first imprisonment. This is a prison epistle. Paul wrote this during his first imprisonment in Rome while he was on the house arrest. He wrote also what we call the prison epistles with our acronym Pepsi like the drink, but spelled different. P-E-P-C. Philemon, Ephesians, 
Philippians, Colossians, or the prison epistles that Paul wrote in his first imprisonment at Rome. This 16th verse here kind of illuminates and reveals to us simply some marks, some visible impressions that ought to be evident in the life of a believing church. So first of all, let me open this up here. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, first of all, we see here this word let is not in the original Greek. It was inserted by translators to expose the responsibility of the believer that it need to be your initiative. God not going to force nothing on you. God not going to make you do nothing. You got volition. You got free will. That's to a curse to some extent. It, was all, it probably would have been better for us if we had no choice. Then you wouldn't have to worry about getting in trouble. But because you got free will and volition and choice, now it becomes your responsibility to admit and permit and allow and approve God in your life. So let is not really in the original. It's inserted by the translators for clarity. But he says here, let the word. The word, the logos, if you will. This is talking about the rationale, the reasoning, the revelation, the speech, the sayings, the teaching, the testimony, the truth, the word. The word. Let, let the word. That's really dealing with the, 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 the thoughts of God. See, God's word reveals God's thoughts. Just like your words reveal what you think. If you wouldn't say nothing, I wouldn't know. But when you open your mouth, you remove all doubt. Let the word, let the word here. And then he gives us this, um, this, this, this proposition here, this word here, this word of possession here. Let the word of Christ. Too many of us let the word of men influence us. And how we conduct ourselves, how we behave ourselves, how we react, how we respond, how we manage, how we handle, how we deal with situations, circumstances, and conditions. And that's why we can't grow. Because we too influenced by people and not by principles, precepts, and prescriptions. You can't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You need to allow, admit, approve, permit the word of Christ. That's an epithet for Jesus. That's not his last name. Amen. We just can't get the first name. We can't put no more pressure on you with surname. Amen. Christ is his title. It's an epithet. An epithet is a substitute for a name or a title given to a person. So Jesus is really the Christ, meaning the Messiah, the deliverer, the redeemer, the healer. He's God. You got to let the word of Christ, the word of Jesus, the word of God, watch this verb, dwell. Yeah, you got to let it live. You got to let it linger. You got to let it last, if you will. You got to let it remain. You got to let it continue. You got to let it abide. Amen. You got to let it take a fixed position, a firm position, if you will, in you. Where at in you? In your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, in your life. You got to let the word of Christ dwell in you and watch this adverb, richly. That means abounding, abundant. Amen. In other words, it needs it need to be something that possess you. I like this word better. It means to influence, to inspire. You need to let the word of God come up in your life and you need to allow it to influence you, to inspire you, to 
to indoctrinate, to instruct, to inform you on what you gonna say, on what you gonna do, or what you gonna think, or where you gonna go, or where you gonna be at. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now here's the byproduct. It leads to wisdom. That word is Sophia. In the Greek, it means to be clear in the mind. See, when you're clear-minded, see, a clear mind leads to clean manners. When your mind is clean, when your mind is clear, I mean, when your mind is clear, then your life can be clean. You'll be able to discern, to detect, to divide, to distinguish what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, what approve of God and what God don't approve of. When you got the word of God in you, see, it gives you insight, intelligence, inspiration. It influences you to separate in the mind. We call that understanding. What God approve of and what God don't approve of so you can make a rational, responsible, and reasonable decision. To make your life better and not bitter. So you can enjoy life and not endure life. Let the word tell somebody, word up. Word up. Yeah, cameo had it right, y'all. Back. Oh, I forgot y'all been saved all y'all life. You don't know nothing about cameo. They had a song back in the day called Word Up. Tell somebody, word up. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, now, here's where the word come in at. My first point. How do I get God's word in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit, in my life to influence me so I can discern what's appropriate? You got to work. That's why some folk can't grow in the church, doc. Lazy. You're lazy. Straight lazy. Wild and lazy. Lazy. Won't come to Sunday school. That's for kids. I thought you were a child of God. Yeah. Won't come to Sunday school. Won't come to Bible study. Amen, somebody. Won't, won't come to church regularly, consistently, habitually, consistently, and constantly, and continue. You can't grow. You can't hear without a preacher. And I give you pastors after my own heart that will feed you with knowledge and understanding. We won't come to discipleship. We won't come to auxiliaries in the church that's been provided to help you to grow in certain areas of your life. Like couples, man. How you married and don't go to couples ministry? You know you don't care nothing about your marriage. You ain't, but you'll go to the movie. You ought to go to church. You ought to go to church. Take your spouse to church. So you can learn how to love your wife and submit to your own husband and not everybody else. You struggling with drugs, you struggling. You ought to go to Sam's ministry. Amen. God has provided auxiliaries and ministries within the church to help you to grow, but you're lazy. I mean, when it's cold and raining, you go to work. But it better not be cold and raining on Sunday morning. I ain't going out there, but you'll go to work. How can you go to work and not go to worship? Sleepy. Somebody, somebody sleepy. You go to work, but you don't go to the same attitude, the same thing that motivates you to get up and go where you don't want to go or to motivate you to get up and go where you need to go. Forsake not the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is. Lazy is what keeps people from growing, maturing, and developing in God. You got to say, say, you got to work. Yeah, you got to rush in. You know, you know how you be rushing to work. You got to rush in to work. How do you get this word deep down in you? Three things, right quick. A, you get it by, first of all, you get it by researching. 
John 5, 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me. And then Jesus says, see, you, 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 don't, you won't come to me that you might believe in me. See, in order for me to get God's word in me, I got I to gotta search. I got to investigate. I got to examine. I got to scrutinize. I got to look at this thing real, real hard. Search. 2 Timothy 2.15, study. The show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing, correctly handling, cut straight the word of truth. You got to search and study. 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 See, when you search and study, the word is stick and stay. Stick and stay. Stick and stay. You got to go to work. You got to rush in the work. You got to rush in the work. Can't be lazy. Amen. You can't be lazy. You got to set aside, set apart time to spend with God in the word. You don't know. You don't think like God. You don't act like God. That's why you got to get God's word in you so you can know his thoughts, so you can have his ways evident in your life. You got to work by researching. Secondly, you got to reflect. God told Joshua, Moses dead. I want you to take these people on over Jordan. Now, here's what's going to help you to be successful as he was. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. In other words, don't stop talking about me. You know why folk don't talk about God? They don't think about him. Yo, what, what, ought to pre, what ought to dominate your conversation is God. You ought to be thinking about God more than you're thinking about anything or anybody. That's why you tripping. <laughs> Wilding. Freaking out. Why? You got too much other stuff on your mind. You need to be thinking about God more than you're thinking about anybody. Anything. It's called meditation. He says, Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Why? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Then David picked it up over in Psalm 1. He says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Amen. No, standeth in the way of sinners. No, sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, I'm talking about the blessed man, I'm talking about the happy man, but his delight, he finds pleasure in what? In his law, in his precepts, principles, and prescriptions, and in his law does he meditate day, so you got to search and study, you got to meditate day and night, you got to do what? Day that means constantly, consistently, continuously, habitually, repeatedly. You think about God all the time. Got to work. Rush in. You do it by researching. Secondly, you do it by rehearsing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Reflecting. And then thirdly, by rehearsing. Yeah. Jesus says, whoever heareth these words of mine and doeth them. That's rehearsing. See, y'all like to come to a rehearsal, but you don't like to rehearse the word. That's why you ain't growing. Sound good when you're saying, but it's sad how you walk. You got to rehearse the word. What it means to rehearse it? It means to practice, perform. It means to execute, to exercise. I call it an acronym. You got to peep it to keep it. You got to peep it. Practice, execute, exercise, perform. You got to peep it to keep it. Tell somebody, peep it. That's how you keep it. Yeah, you got to practice, execute, exercise, perform the word. You got to rehearse it. 
Whoever hears these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him as a man that built his house upon a rock. When the rains descended, the floods came, the wind blew and beat upon that house, it fell not. Why? Because it was founded, settled, established upon a rock. But whoever hear these things of mine and doeth them not, he's like a foolish man that built his house upon the sand. Rains descended, floods came, wind blew, beat upon that house, and great was the fall of it. You got to rehearse the word. James put it this way, be ye doers, practitioners, performers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own self. You deceive yourself when you think that just coming to church and hearing the word is sufficient. That's inadequate. It's not enough to hear the word. It's insufficient. It's good to hear the word. It's good to come to church and hear the word, but that's inadequate. That's insufficient. You got to be doers of the word. The marks of a mature church is that they rush in to work by researching, reflecting, rehearsing. Secondly, the mark of a mature church is seen by witnessing. See, when God deposits his word in you, now you have revelation. Because the word is the revelation of God. Amen. And when the word is in you, that means you have the revelation of God in you. And with revelation come responsibility. See, we got folk that got word in them but won't share it. That's why they're not growing. Amen. See, if you just keep eating the word and keep eating the word and don't live it and don't share it, you get fat. Like that. Yeah. Now, it's good to be fat in the word, but not fat from the word. Yeah. See, some folk fat from the word. They're not fat in the word. See, when you're fat in the word, that means you're faithful, available, and trustworthy with the word. Faithful, available, trustworthy in the word. That means when you get it, you get it. It's just that good. I remember, it's a bad analogy, don't do this. But I remember before I got saved, gave my life to Christ, I was involved with racketeering and drug trafficking. Man, time I got something good, I let everybody know I got, hey, I got it. Now y'all done got saved, got the word in you. A secret disciple. <laughs> Nick at night. You got a witness. God done gave you insight. God done gave you intelligence. God done gave you information. God done gave you instruction. God done indoctrinated you with his word, with his thoughts, with his principles, with his precepts, with his prescriptions. Now you have a responsibility to reach out. Witnessing. Amen. That involves two things here. A, first we witness by education. Verse 16b. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. See, teaching, that means to instruct, to inform, to indoctrinate. Amen. It means basically to tell people, amen, to tell people what God approve of. You come in contact with people in the church. You come in contact with people at work. You come in contact with people at home. You come in contact with people that you're related to, that you're not related to. You come in contact with people that don't like you. And God has put something in you to share with them about what he expects from them. And some of y'all won't do it. That's why you're not growing. You're just going. You got a witness for the Lord. God saved you to witness. All 
this stuff God done did for you and you ain't telling nobody? Now you, now you quick to talk about something ain't true. Oh, 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 let, 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 hey, hey, I heard they was over there. Oh, wow, oh, wow, you at work, oh, wow, you texting now. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you, you sending messages now. Child, you heard about Critton? Boy, if something get out on me, boy, breaking news. I told you, I told you, told you, when all that, told you. Folk don't, folk don't, folk don't share stuff that you do good, but you better not do nothing bad. You better not, boy, it's breaking news. We all anchors now. We all journalists now, all of a sudden. Ain't seen Northwestern. Journalism school. Yeah, we ain't seen Northwest, but now we're a journalist. Well, go, we test the line about something we didn't see or something we didn't hear directly. You gotta witness. You gotta you gotta you gotta educate. Now listen, the ultimate way we educate people is first by a example. Don't, don't, you, you can't say do as I say and not as I do. That, that, that's hypocrisy. That's provocation. That's what a lot of children, parent relationships are messed up about. You're telling your kid, you're going to mind me, you do what I tell you, and they should. But you should be an example. You can't tell them don't smoke weed and you smoke cigarettes. You can't tell them to don't drink beer and you dip snuff. You got to be an example and an example. Provoke not your children to wrath. You teach first by example. Don't nobody want to hear what you say. They want to see what you do. We don't want to hear no more sermons from you. We want to see a sermon from you. But you live in. You got to be an example and an example to people. That's how you teach. You shouldn't have to say a word. I didn't have a whole lot of Bible studies in my house. Mm -mm. No, we have to do no Bible study. Not the way me and Mumu used to live. No, just look at us. We got no Bible study. I mean, now we can have it. Now don't open that up now because we might be up all night because you know I, I teach all night now. <laughs> Y'all want to have Bible study? That's all right, Ram. <laughs> we know we, we got children obey your parents. Now what that's all. Uh, no, no. You, you shouldn't have to you shouldn't have to. I mean, you, it's optional. But, but if you got to have Bible study and, and, and folk don't inf are not influenced by your lifestyle, your behavior, you should be an example. That's how you teach. You teach by example, by example. So you teach by example, example. Then secondly, you teach by experience. Now that, that's not the best way. It's a good way, but it ain't the best way. See, education is better than experience. I mentioned to a guy recently, they kept telling him to stop drinking and driving, stop drinking and driving, stop drinking. He wouldn't stop. One third, he got off from work, got in his truck, got drunk, on his way home, hit a vehicle, ran into a car, four people was in there, that car blew it up in smoke and fire. Them people in that car died, they charged him with four counts of vehicular manslaughter. He was 67 years old when that happened. He got to do 60 years. He ain't going to live to be no 127. But now he gets it. That not only should he not drink and drive, he shouldn't drink at all. He get it now, but look what it cost him. It cost him more than he want to spend, going to keep him longer than he want to stay, and taking him further up the panhandle he want to go. Experience is a good teacher. It ain't the best. See, if he would have listened to somebody say, stop drinking and driving, he could have saved himself some time. I get it. Experience is a good teacher. Now, it ain't the best. It's more expensive. <laughs> Education. Teaching. Then secondly, admonition means basically exhortation. See, we got to be willing when the word is in us to tell people that ain't right. God ain't pleased with that. Now, nothing personal now. I love you. My sister, my brother, whatever. 
my son, my daughter, whatever, my mom, my daddy, whatever. Love you now, but God ain't pleased if you choose to do that. You got to admonish, put in the mind to caution, to challenge, to correct, to chasten. Somebody won't tell you the truth, they don't love you. And if somebody tell you the truth, they ain't hating. You just hate the truth. You do it by, you witness by education. You tell people what's appropriate. And you do it by exhortation. You warn people, this is not acceptable to God. It's not my opinion. It's not my, it's not my word. I, I'm getting this from, from God. See, God's word is in me. And when I tell you something, I'm not telling you something because I don't like it or I don't like you. I'm telling you something because that's what God said. Matter of fact, I can show it to you. Now you read it. Where well, that's interpretation. Play with that. <laughs> Keep playing. We post a witness. That's a sign of a mature church. We witness. We don't tolerate stuff up in this room, up in this house that God do not approve of. We have to teach people when they come in off the street. No, we don't conduct ourselves like that up in here. We don't do stuff. This is the house of God. You, we don't worship this building, but this building symbolizes God's presence, and we don't respect God when we come up in here. And sometimes, in love, in love, you have to pull people to the side. Don't talk about them to everybody. Else. No, you go to them. Look here, my brother, my sister. God ain't pleased with that kind of behavior. God, God is not pleased with you how you reacted and responded like that. That's not Christ-like. Jesus don't act like that. And you're supposed to be a Christian, which means you're a follower, a student, a pupil, a disciple of Christ. You got to act like him. But you can't if the world ain't in you. So you just got exposed. You just been going and not growing. You witness by education, and you witness by exhortation. So you got to reach out. You got to rush in. And third, as I clue, conclude here, you got to run down. Because see, sometimes when we get a little knowledge, you learn two or three scriptures. Not, 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 can nobody tell you. Not, not, not see, now you think you're all that. And, and, and God forbid you go to school, and you get some, and you get some documentation. You know, saying that you got a Ph.D., E.F.G., H.I.J.K.L.F.D. See, oh, 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 it's over now. Now you want to be worshipped instead of worshiping God. So, so a mark of a true maturing church is not only do they rush in to work and reach out to witness, but they run down to worship. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Singing is an expression or a gesture of worship. See, worship is not restricted to a service. Worship is a style of living. See, we don't go to worship. We worship as we go. Yeah, we worship what? I don't go worshiping. I worship as I go. See, you see, work and worship is not restricted to just the place. I worship in Walmart. I worship at Wawa. I worship at church. I worship at home. I worship when I'm driving. I worship when I'm walking. I worship when I'm eating. I'm honoring God with whatever I do, wherever I'm at. It's a lifestyle. Singing, watch this, with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The grace word there is the Greek word that's translated. It's the divine influence upon the heart, the mind, that's reflected in the life. See, the grace of God is when, see, the grace of God is always reflected in one's life that the grace is upon. See, grace is God's influence upon your heart that's reflected in your life. 
God is influencing you. That's grace. That's grace when God influences you to think and act and say and do what he say, do, think, and act. That's grace. That's influence. And see, when God is influencing you, it ought to be evident in your manners, in your behavior, in your conduct, in your demeanor, in your decorum, in your disposition, in your lifestyle. It ought to be reflected in your life. And when God is truly worshipped, watch this as I conclude, when God is worshipped, it's reflecting what's pleasing, what's pleasant, what's precious, what's proper to God. That's what worship is. Reflecting what's pleasing, pleasant, proper, and precious to God. That's worship. And here's four ways you express. Here's the outlet of that worship. See, when we worship God, we worship God, first of all, in our conscience. In our conscience, see? See, you worship God in your mind. You reflect God's grace. How? In your mind. The Bible said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Paul picked up like this. He says, those things, he says, whatsoever things are true and just and honest and pure and lovely, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, why, think on, the, you need to worship God with your mind. You need to cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You should be letting your mind be a garbage can for the devil to drop his junk in. Your mind need to be acceptable in his sight. We worship God in our conscience, in our mind. Secondly, we worship God in our conversation with your mouth. Now, that's a real measure. You read James 3. That's a real measure of spiritual maturity. What? Your mouth. See, you underestimate your tongue. Every morning, every morning you ought to get in the mirror and t look, at, look, at, look in the mirror and lick your tongue out and say, you're going to do what God say today. You ain't going to say that. You're not going to say that. See, you think because your tongue is a little memo, it don't have no influence. The tongue is, the tongue is small but influential. Man, uh, you go out to sea world, a man stick his head in an orca's mouth. An orca, a killer whale. He done train that whale. A killer whale. You go to some of these zoos, they don't train tame lions and all this stuff. Get out there and feed the lion. A ferocious, untame them. But we can't tame the tongue. <laughs> Unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Out of it, we send blessing and cursing. We say, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hell no. Same mouth, same mouth, same mouth, blessing and cursing, brethren, these things ought not so to be. You're immature. I couldn't help it. It slipped out. No, it didn't. It's in your heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, that word ain't dwelling in you. Because that word was dwelling in you, that word would let you know, hey, he trying to come in. Profanity trying to come in. Beep, 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 beep. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, my shrimp. That's worship. You worship God with your conscience. You worship God with your conversation. Thirdly, you worship God in your conduct. Those things that you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. You worship God in your conduct. In your behavior, in your, in your lifestyle, 
You don't wait to come to church to worship. You're supposed to worship God on your job, your conduct. You're supposed to worship God when you're driving. You respect other people on the road. I hear shooting birds at people. <laughs> Calling God's people. You bless God who made, and, and you bless God, then you curse man who made in the similitude of God. You worship conscience, you worship conversation, you worship conduct, and that ought to, content, that ought to, that ought to promote character. You ought to be moral in how you behave. In other words, it ought to be your reputation. You ought to have, you ought to be known on your job, in the church, in your home, in relationship. You ought to be known. You ought to have a reputation for being ethical and moral. Because you are a worshiper of God. Marks of a mature church. There are three characteristics that only indicate that you are growing in Christ as a church, as a Christian. You rush in, work, research, reflect, rehearse. You reach out, witness, education, exhortation. You run down to worship in conscience. In conversation, in conduct, in character. Marks of a mature, of 137 years. You got a responsibility to give some marks of a maturing church. Godspeed. We don't ever want to take anyone for granted. We have done what the Lord has commanded, and yet there's still room. If you're in this audience today and you never ever accepted Jesus Christ into your life as Lord, that means He makes all the decisions. You can't call Him Lord and don't do what He say. That's religion. That's a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Ever learning and not coming into the knowledge of the truth. If you're in this room and you never ever accepted Jesus Christ into your life as Lord, we invite you to come. Maybe you've accepted him as Lord, but you kind of went astray and went away. You don't lose your salvation. You don't lose your relationship. You break your fellowship. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. And as far as the east is from the west, he'll remove your transgressions from you. Restoration. Salvation. Maybe you're in this audience today and you're just going through something. Your salvation, your discipleship is intact, but you're going through something. You're dealing with something. Or you know somebody going through something and you want to stand in the gap. We'll pray for you. If you don't have a church home, God don't want no homeless Christian. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. I'm talking about a spiritual home. Salvation, restoration, invocation, church location, whatever your situation, we invite you to come. Receive what you need from the Lord.
want to just stand in prayer. We have two situations. They're personal in one sense and a tragedy in another sense. These families standing for a loss and a personal devotion and a commitment that need to be made concerning the domestic issue. These are all saints of God. They are people of God. But we want to intercede on their behalf. God knows, I don't want to vocalize it, but God knows in that situation. He speaks comforting words to those who have lost a loved one. He says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. It doesn't mean that it, that it, anything particular reason why you lost your loved one. It never means that. Death is an appointed time. So we pray for the comfort of the irreversible. And pray that your comfort and your belief in God may enhance you to experience.